the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, how the Italians were figuring out to use the newest Daimler-Benz engine. Challenge, catching up with the 80 GMs and outrunning them. And Metal Beasts, one of the most famous World War II SPGs. It's time for some classics in Metal Beasts. Today, we look at the famous German tank destroyer, the Jagdpanther at BR 6.3. Strong frontal armor, a deadly powerful gun, and a predator-like mobility make this machine one of the most memorable ones in its tech tree. The Jagdpanther's 88mm cannon elevates from minus 8 to plus 14 degrees and turns 11 degrees to both the left and the right. Additional armament consists of one forward-facing machine gun and smoke grenade launchers. The 80mm thick upper glacy plate occupies most of the frontal outline. Its slope angle is 55 degrees. Its weak spots are the ball-shaped mount of the machine gun and the area around the gun mantlet. The sides are protected by 50mm of armor and the lower glacy plate is 60 millimeters thick. Plus, it has a massive transmission immediately behind it. The machine is managed by a crew of five and driven by an engine with a capacity of 700 horsepower. German designers created the Jagdpanther to be a purebred tank destroyer. Its gun easily penetrates most Tier 4 opponents, with APCBC rounds carrying 100 grams of TNT equivalent explosives. The armor can withstand massive shelling from medium and light tanks cannons, and there's enough mobility to be one of the first to enter the battle. Finally, good elevation angles allow you to effectively fight on virtually any terrain. However, each advantage has a flip side. The powerful gun reloads for more than 8 seconds, which isn't bad for a tank, but not enough for an SPG. The armor is good due to its slopes, but if an enemy gets above you on a hill, he'll easily break the Jagdpanther, even in the front. Finally, the machine is only mobile when it comes to driving forward. The reverse is only 4 kilometers per hour, <laughs> so it will be difficult to retreat, even with the smoke grenade launchers. From the tactical perspective, the long and medium distances are optimal for battling. From such distances, the enemy will hardly have time to find the vulnerabilities of your machine. On the other hand, the Jagdpanther itself, with its 10 times optics, easily discovers enemies and sends them to the hangar one by one. Your mobility allows you to quickly take advantageous positions, but it doesn't give you any reason to rush into close combat at full speed. There, the absence of a turret and vulnerable sides will immediately make your experience uh, quite painful. The Jagdpanther loves accurate gameplay, in which it acts as a hunter most of the time. The key to earning maximum frags on it is delivering pinpoint strikes and catching retaliation fire with your frontal armor. The elegant RE2000 fighter, the first creation of the engineers Longhi and Aliesi, was almost perfect. It was simply magnificent in the air, and its swift turns were breathtaking. There was only one problem, the insanely overcomplicated design. It had a five-spar elliptical wing, moreover, with integral fuel tanks that would leak after the first flight. How do you use such a disposable aircraft in combat conditions? The design needed some refinements. Simplifying the spar set, protecting the fuel tanks, strengthening the weapons as well. Such upgrades would make this aircraft just ideal. 
And while the military were compiling lists of requirements and designers were struggling how to figure out what to do with them and fulfill them, the crucial moment came for the Italian fighter aviation. Regia Aeronautica finally got the long-awaited Daimler-Benz 601A. The German inline engine from the famous BF-109 and, of course, they've ordered a new fighter for it. The experienced aircraft designer Mario Costoldi quickly got the lead in that competition with the Marchi C202 Folgore project, for which was soon recognized to be the best and put into serial production. It would seem impossible for Roberto Longhi and Antonio Lesi to compete with the old maestro. After all, even on paper their new RE2001 was hopelessly losing to the competitor both in speed and climb rate. But the designer's duo still had a trump up their sleeve. The elliptical wing. It provided for excellent maneuverability and a very low stall speed. That meant that the machine could be operated from small sites, for example, adapted for takeoff from the deck of an aircraft carrier, which, however, <laughs> Italy still didn't have. Still, the plane could carry a much greater combat load, and this meant additional fuel and increased range, as well as bombs, torpedoes, and more powerful cannons. As for the Folgore, it was a purebred fighter, and any attempt to slightly load it led to a sharp drop in flight performance. In a word, the RE-2001 only needed a bit of modification. Simplification of the wing to a three-spar one. Designing a fuselage with a narrow nose for an inline liquid-cooled engine, and that's it. Even with the new fuel capacitors, now protected and ordinary instead of integral, the combat range of the machine was 300 kilometers wider than its competitor, and this was vital, especially when it came to escorting bombers raiding Malta. So, in Regia Aeronautica, they decided to produce two seemingly similar fighters, perfectly complementing one another. Moreover, the calculations didn't lie. The attempt to install 20mm cannons on the Folgore ended with a single experimental plane, while on the RE-2001CN, they took root perfectly. The Marquis couldn't carry even small bombs, and the RE-2001 calmly took off carrying a 600kg monster during test flights. They were even experimenting with torpedoes, though no one actually needed it. And although the fighter by Longhi and Alessi have never been built in such quantities as the famous Falgore, it still got to be mass-produced and earned an unofficial honorary title of Jack of All Trades for its versatility. And that's also pretty good, isn't it? This challenge started with a comment from Good Man under a Russian version of the show, Try flying a plane to catch up with the slowest ATGM in the game. Well, at first glance, the task isn't that difficult. After all, the speed of the slowest ATGM in the game, which is the Japanese Type 64 guided missile, is only 85 meters per second, or a little over 300 kilometers per hour. Almost any biplane can catch up with it. But what if we go further? We'll be taking increasingly faster missiles and try to keep up with them as well. Here's, for example, the German SS-11 ATGM. Its speed is already 150 meters per second or 540 kilometers per hour. To catch up with it, many piston aircraft would have to dive first to pick up some speed but some of them can cope in horizontal flight too. For example, the P-51D-30 easily catches up and outruns this guided missile. Following the German ATGM, we take a Soviet one installed on the IT-1. Its speed already exceeds 800 kilometers per hour, which means that pilots on piston engine aircraft can just forget about it. Let's move on to early jets. 
The German Messerschmitt 262 accelerates to 830 kilometers per hour near the ground and brilliantly completes the mission at hand. The American tow guided missile is even faster. Its maximum speed on the trajectory approaches supersonic numbers, 1,076 kilometers per hour. That's a lot, but we still have quite enough subsonic aircraft that are able to catch up with it. For example, the Soviet LA-200 interceptor, which accelerates up to 1,100 kph near the ground. It may comfortably accompany this ATGM on its path. And let's finish it with the most serious challenge. This time, we compete with the supersonic 9M119 guided missile from the arsenal of the T-80U tank. Its speed is 1,440 km per hour. The top Soviet jet aircraft barely can overcome the mark of 1,300 kph, which is not even close. The American F-4 accelerates to 1,400 near the ground. Close, but still not enough for what we want to achieve. But wait, weren't the British Phantoms equipped with slightly more powerful engines? Maybe this small increase in speed will be enough to outrun the Soviet ATGM? Let's check it. The speedometer shows 1,400 kph. 1,430? The plane is approaching the flutter point, but yes, we got it! 1,440 kilometers per hour, and the pilot can now see the nearby guided missile from his cockpit. Victory! Challenge complete! Literally at breakpoint, but in the end, we still managed to catch up with the fastest ATGMs. And now, with a sense of accomplishment, we can proceed to answering your questions that you ask in the comments. The first message was sent by a player called Toxic Acid. When is the full Swedish army tree going to be out planning on getting Sturv? As we promised, the complete Swedish ground tree lands into the game with the very next major update. It will be out quite soon, so keep an eye out for our announcements. Fortnite Ali A asks, how can you put out a fire on a plane? In reality, a fire on an aircraft is a nightmare. The speed is huge, so there's a lot of oxygen coming in. So much that even aluminum burns like paper. By the way, this is enough reason on its own for most civilian aviation companies to prohibit smoking on board. And there are more apart from that one, so don't smoke on planes, people. To the question at hand, sometimes it helps turning the engine off. You might shake the fire away after that, but mostly, if you've managed to douse a burning plane, consider yourself lucky. You won't be able to do it consistently. Then there's a question sent by Kristina Huicheva. I want to ask how I can turn off my helicopter engine. By default, you're looking for the button I. But keep in mind that this maneuver is quite risky. The helicopter will start losing altitude on auto-rotation, so you'll have to be extremely careful with your descent speed if you don't want to crash. The faster you're descending, the faster the air is coming to your rotors, which means you have more thrust and more control over the machine. Contrarily, the slower you're descending, the slower is your rotor speed, hence you'll have less control. If you find balance between these two extremes, you'll have a chance for a successful landing. And the last message for today was written by Tank Ace 1215. Heavy bomber triathlon, please. Thanks for the idea. We'll think about it, or to be more specific, we'll find a way to make this competition spectacular and illustrative enough. We'll definitely include it in one of the coming episodes. Well, once again, folks, that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. Come on, subscribe to the channel, because you don't want to miss anything. Click the bell, leave a like. And as I've said before, you do it because you do like it. 
and tell us what you think in the comments below. And remember that the second season of the World War is still ongoing for a few more days, so don't forget to check it out. And we'll see you once again on The Shooting Range, but next week.